Good morning. Good morning and welcome, as always, to Niles First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. How good it is to be here, those of us that have had the opportunity to brave the roads, those of us that are in physical presence here, but how good it is to be gathered uh, for those of us that are online as well. For certainly, no matter where we are, we are part of the body of Christ and individually members of it. It is nice when we can gather in person, but it is good when we are able to gather through technology, to be present with each other, and certainly present in the presence of God. We have a few things that we can announce this morning. Uh, you can find most of it in your bulletin as well. If you're joining us online, you can find that bulletin at firstchristianniles.org. Uh, following service, and actually right now, I, I know that some folks have already picked up your soup and, and sandwiches, but if you head downstairs to Fellowship Hall, our missions committee is uh, putting together a free will offering for uh, soup and sandwiches, and I don't think anything will hit the spot quite like warm soup right now. So uh, feel free to head down there and support our missions as well as, uh, um, as to provide some sustenance for yourself. Uh, we also have a trustees meeting directly following worship. Uh, Tuesday, we have the Youngstown Rescue Mission dinner. Uh, if you've signed up for that, we invite you to be there for that. Uh, Wednesday, our Bible study continues, not only in person, but online as well. You can find the Zoom invite for our Bible study um, on the praises and prayers that we send out weekly, as well as uh, printed in the narthex this morning. Although it's a little difficult because the hyperlink is something that makes a whole lot more sense when you're on a computer. Uh, it doesn't do much when it's printed out on paper, but at least it'll direct you in the right way. Uh, we invite you to be a part of Bible study not only this week, but every week. We are uh, continuing our infancy narrative and should wrap up um, the infancy narrative of Luke. We have some direction for our new Bible study, which is uh, going to take a look at some more uh, controversial topics within Christianity. Uh, so if you have any controversial controversial topics that you would like us to study um, or for our group to work over, uh, please let me know and I'll be more than happy to put together that curriculum. We also have um, our uh, tab meeting this Thursday. It's uh, not going to be at my house like the, uh, like the bulletin says. Instead, we're going to meet at Stoneyard on the patio. Uh, and I know what you're thinking. This isn't exactly the best season for a patio uh, meeting. But uh, Stoneyard does pretty well. They've, uh, they've cut down the wind with uh, some uh, screens, and they have a good heater out there. Uh, and it's a good opportunity for us to be able to gather. So we are the, the prompt for tab this week is actually that, that final and gray line between politics and religion. Should be a fun conversation. Um, and of course, I need to remind everybody that our tab meeting, we only have two rules. Every question is valid uh, and, and every answer must be given in Christian charity. So that should make it all the more exciting for us to be able to have this conversation. Uh, we invite you to be a part of that Thursday at 6. And, you know, that's perfect if you're in choir because our choir just started up. You can join for half of the meeting, walk right down the street, and and join in to choir uh, at 6.30 on Thursday. Um, I believe that should be what we, uh, Carolyn has asked uh, as well, if you have a, a yearbook uh, report to send in, please make sure to do that as soon as possible. But other than that, may this be a place of warmth. Not just physically, but might this be a place where we are spiritually satiated, that we come here to be filled and indeed are, uh, not just from the words that we hear God speaking in our midst, but from the compassion and camaraderie that we gain when we gather as the body of Christ. May this be a place where we are warmed, our bodies and souls. Indeed, may this be the case as we join together in our call to worship. We are gathered, in part, to envision the world that God has planned for us. Through scripture, we see the divine's vision for heaven on earth. In all these things, might we seek the will of God in song, in scripture, and in prayer. Amen. May we join together then in our opening hymn. 
This is holy ground. This can be found in your chalice praise. Uh, it's the little uh, blue hymnal that you can find in your pews. That's on page 55. together in an attitude of prayer, first of silent prayer, naming to God, indeed in conversation with God, that which we hope for, that which we need, that which we desire for others, those things that we see in the world that do need change, that are broken and beyond our abilities, may we bring them to God, who certainly hears us and moves for good in this creation. I then invite you to hear the morning prayer, to join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. eternal and loving God. You who call us time and time again to abide with you as you abide with us. Oh God, in this place, in this world, in this time where everybody seems to be shouting, where it's so difficult to hear over the din of humanity, of competing voices, how we wish to hear you. We strain our ears to listen for some good, godly word, to hear again good news in the midst of destruction and devastation, how we hope to hear you again. Yet we know, O oh God, that you are still speaking in this creation as you have spoken it into existence as you have separated the waters from the air, as you have breathed life into all these creatures through your word, O oh God, we still listen for your creative acts today. It's more difficult. It must be because we struggle so to hear you, O oh God. We set time and meditation to listen to you. 
We give thanks before meals, before we drift to sleep. We speak to you. Maybe our trouble is in listening. For we know that you are still speaking. You are still bringing good news to this creation. You are still creating that which is good around us. So we ask that you not just open our ears that we might hear you, but open our eyes that we might see your creative acts. Open our hearts that we might see the good you do in this creation, that we might participate in it, that we might indeed be co-creators. In all things, then, let us enter in prayer. Let, us, let our prayer be consistent and constant. In formal, in formal prayers that we grew up with, reciting in ways that bring us comfort, in new ways of speaking to you that encourage new ways of hearing your voice, and even in all the core of our being, O oh God, might our sights be aligned to you. Might our hearts be attuned to you. Might every waking moment, might every sleeping moment, like, might every moment of our existence be in prayer, in conversation, in loving communication with you, O oh God. Might it all be for you. And as we seek and strive and struggle to hear you, O oh God, let us hear. Simply let us hear. In our struggles, might we be comforted as we hear your good words. In our hopelessness, bring us comfort. In our brokenness, bring us reconciliation to one another and to you. But may it start in prayer. Might it start with us speaking to you our desires, our hopes, our fears. Might it start with us listening to you, O oh, still speaking God. In all these things, might we grow ever closer to you as we grow closer to each other in our fellowship. Until the day that we are at one with you, O oh God, and all this creation again is reconciled to your being. This is our fervent hope and our prayer. Indeed, it is the prayer that we lift up every week that we gather, perhaps every night before we go to sleep, when we use those words that your Son has given us, when we pray to you in one voice, saying, Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Might we hear a prayer from our choir this morning?
I invite us then to hear our scripture reading for this morning. From 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 28. If you wish to follow along, I'd invite you to uh, pick up your pew Bible or the Bible that you bring with you or whatever you have on uh, your phone to, to read along with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 28. But we appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and have charge of you in the Lord and admonish you. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, beloved, to admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seeks to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Christ Jesus. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Beloved, pray for us. Greet all the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. I solemnly command you by the Lord that this letter be read to all of them. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. May God indeed grace this reading and all readings of God's holy word. I invite you to join me in an attitude of prayer. Gracious and loving God, might our whole being be in prayer, in communication with you, from our waking to our sleeping to our dreaming. Might we pray to you. Might the conversation lead us to be more like you. Might our prayers grow us to grow as the kingdom grows alongside us. In all these things, may all that we say and do and think be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There's a whole genre of video games that are simulations of real life. There's every kind of simulation that you can think of. In a video game, you can be a roller coaster tycoon. You could pretend to be a bee. There's a goat simulator where you're just a goat. You do, you do goat things. I've not played it, but I imagine that it's pretty limited in its scope. You eat grass and you sleep. And uh, One of my favorites, though, are the simulations uh, that act like real life. One of the first ones that, that played like this was called The Sims. There's multiple iterations of this at this point, but I remember playing this game in like middle school, it must have been for me. And I thought how fun, I could pretend to, to, to be real life without having all the stress and anxiety of real life. I can make mistakes in this game and it doesn't matter because I can restart it and reset it. One of the fun things about The Sims is you're called to make friends like you do in real life. Again, with, I thought, without the anxiety of what it takes to make friends in real life. I don't know about you, but over the past two years, during this time of pandemic, keeping friends, making friends, has been an opportunity for stress and anxiety for me. It's difficult when we don't have the same means to gather, to make friends. It was so simple in The Sims. All you had to do was call someone over and they'd come over and you'd be friends. It was so simple. You didn't have to worry about what their schedule was. You didn't have to worry about uh, anything that might get in the way of jobs, of hobbies. You called someone over, they'd come over, you'd eat dinner, and you'd be friends. What I learned in that game, though, is you have to keep contact or you lose your friend. That was, a, that was the first time I felt real anxiety in a video game beyond, you know, falling on the spikes as Mario. You would see this friendship meter and all your friends would be full as you, as you first made friends with them. But over time, you start to see that bar creeping lower and lower until it turned yellow. 
until it would turn red. And all of a sudden you knew you were going to lose them as a friend if you didn't call them back. That was a lot of anxiety for me in middle school. It was so easy in middle school because you're just surrounded by the same people all the time. You don't have to worry about calling them over except for maybe the, the, the sleepover if your parents allowed it. Making friends requires constant contact. That was one thing that The Sims taught me. And it's true to life. Now we can say that we're friends with folks that we haven't met since the last high school reunion, but chances are a lot has changed in the time that you've last talked to them. Chances are you might not consider yourself best friends with some of the folks that you were best friends with in an earlier time in your life. And I can guarantee that the reason that you're not uh, friends with them in the same way is because you haven't kept up communication. And maybe it's not your fault. Maybe things have gotten in the way. But that lack of communication causes distancing between people. I think uh, it was, it was um, excuse me, where am I at here? It was George Woodbury that said, I am quite sure that no friendship yields its true pleasure and nobility of nature without frequent communication, without sympathy and service. How true that friendship takes and requires communication, that we know about another person as they know us, that we empathize with the struggles of that individual in the way that they empathize with us. If you want to put it a little more simply, St. Francis de Sales said, friendship requires great communication. There's truth to this. Now, sometimes we're friends as mutual acquaintances. Uh, I've started to make new friends just because Ellie has made friends with other kids, and I'm all of a sudden friends with their parents, and isn't that just the easiest thing in the world? That was a windfall for me. It was, it was, it was very nice that I didn't have to go through the same amount of effort that I normally would have to, to make and maintain and keep friends, which seems to be a hobby of its own and requires a great deal of effort. But it doesn't always. There are those rare opportunities when someone just falls out of the sky and clicks with you. That speaking with them becomes a joy rather than a hindrance. That meeting up with someone is something that elevates your soul rather than causing you anxiety because you're about to lose that friend meter and all of a sudden just be acquaintances again. Sometimes. We click with folks in such a way that the world opens up and the skies part and all of a sudden, you're just friends. The communication is not something that you have to put on your calendar, not something that you say, I need to get back to this person, I need to call them, I need to return that email or that text that I see is still lit up on my phone and I just keep scrolling past it that causes me anxiety. This is, this is not a, a particular case of mine, I'm just, I know that this happens. All of this, all of this, the ways that we maintain friendships as individuals, the ways that communication is just sometimes fun and easy with people, we learn this from God, our first communicator, the one who first spoke all things into creation, including ourselves. The beginning of that conversation began with God saying, let there be and finding it good. And somewhere in the midst of all of that, God said, let there be a Chris Stark. And somehow God found that good. Somewhere in the midst of that, God said, let there be you, each and every one of you, and found that good. That was the beginning of a conversation that you have had with God since your first waking moments. And like all conversations and like all friendships, sometimes it's a little one-sided. Sometimes we forget to put in the legwork to maintain that friendship. But that communication is first and foremost prayer. Now, if we are called, like last week we talked about our role in baptism as we find the role of, of the baptism of Christ, that we find meaning in our baptism in a way that calls us to be connected with God, to be indeed immersed in the presence of God at all times and all places, to be aware of that connection that we have made with our baptismal vows through covenant. Part of that covenant is to be in constant conversation with God. Now, interestingly, it looks different for all of us. 
If I asked you what your prayer life looked like, you might be really happy to share it, or you might be a little intimidated to share it. It might be something that you do every time you wake up and every time you go to bed, when you gather around meals, that you have that formal prayer that you learned when you were a kid. God is great. God is good. Let us thank you for his food. Or it might just be an unspoken groaning that goes beyond our words. It might be every time that we see an accident or see a newsworthy article of some terrible thing that has happened, our mind goes straight to God, let them be okay. Our prayer life looks different. Each and every one of us, our prayer life is different. We probably have some similarities because of the, con the frequency and the consistency by which we gather. And by sharing our community with one another, we learn some of the same um, functions, some of the same tips and tricks. We learn how to be Christians because of the Christian community around us. So some of our prayer life should be in tune with one another. But as unique individuals, our prayer life is inherently different. That doesn't mean that it is not prayer if it doesn't function in a certain way. It doesn't mean that if you don't say the rosary 15 times a day that you're not praying in the right way. It doesn't mean that if you don't pray before you go to bed or before a meal you're not praying in the right way because I know some folks who are just immersed in prayer. That every thought in some way is a connection to God. Have you ever met someone like that? I know a few here. And I'm proud to know them. Because something about who they are is a constant connection to God. Let me say that we are all constantly connected to God. There is no way to remove that connection because God spoke it this way in creation. That we are inherently part of creation and creatures that have been made by our creator. As such, we have a deep connection to the divine within ourselves and around ourselves. But let's be honest, sometimes we quit paying attention to it. Sometimes, like any friendship, we forget to maintain it. Sometimes, like with family or, or with very close friends, the nature of that relationship changes over time. That's not to say that God ever changes, but we do. And as such, in our growth, in our move to maturity, in our, our growth towards mature disciples, the way that we communicate with each other and with God is apt to change. There is no wrong way to pray. There's a lot of right ways. How do you speak to God? Is it something that is a daily endeavor for you? Is it something that is rote and ritual? Is it something that is perfunctory words that come out of your mouth every day? Or is it something more of a heartfelt, um, made up along the way? Maybe a combination of both. I know sometimes somebody has written words better than I can speak. I know sometimes things are so specific in my life that all I can do is say, you're seeing this God, help me out. God knows. God knows even when our words fall short. Even when we forget to pray in some formal manner. Even if it's just a shout, a lament to our Creator to change this, please, because things are broken. God hears. God listens. We don't have to worry about our relationship meter ever shrinking to the point that we're no longer friends with God and just acquaintances because God makes sure to always reach out to us. Indeed, that, that, um, that song by the choir, I, I hear it as a prayer. I hear it as a prayer. Because we know there's an assurance that God is always reaching back to us even when we forget to reach out. Even when we are so overcome with grief or emotion or just apathy because of the way the world is that we forget, our soul is still reaching out to God. Even if our words fall short, who we are as creatures of the divine calls us to pray unceasingly. We are called to be immersed in prayer, to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, to give thanks in all circumstances. And I'll tell you what, that line in 1 Thessalonians, uh, it, it, that line right there explains the rest of the chapter. If you can manage that verse, 
The rest of it falls into place. How can you not, if you're rejoicing always, if you're praying without ceasing, how can you be mean? How can you break apart? How can you judge? To do this lays the road for the rest. Indeed, we are told the power of prayer throughout Scripture, throughout the Hebrew Scriptures and throughout the New Testament. Luke goes out of his way to tell stories about people praying. Luke is the only gospel where when Jesus is baptized, Jesus takes time to pray before the Spirit descends. We hear from John in Jesus' words, in John 15, 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. I've always had a problem with that verse because there's a lot that I would wish for. And as of yet, I don't have a, a backyard roller coaster. The pool hasn't showed up after my fervent prayer. So I had to look at that verse again, and it tells me, if you abide in me, Jesus is saying, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. If you know Jesus' words, it's not that there's limitations on what we can ask for, but it steadies our thoughts. Christ is always abiding with us. God's presence is always with us. It's our thoughts that get in the way. It's our own presence that causes us to stumble. But when we are at our best, we see that direct line of communication with the divine, and we can't help but be friends with God. We can't help but to strengthen that relationship because we see all that God is doing for us. We see what God is calling us to, to be better than we have been in the past, to strengthen ourselves as disciples, as those that follow the Christ. That doesn't tell me I can't ask God for a pull. But it tells me there's more important things to ask for. There's things that we should be working on together. And the beauty of a conversation is that sometimes you hear truth even when you don't want to. Sometimes you need to hear some placating fluff, let's be honest. And God does that too. God tells us we're good enough. God tells us that we are loved no matter who we are and no matter what we have done. In your prayer life, I hope that you have heard that truth from God, that you are beloved, that you are worthy to be in relationship with the divine and with those that follow the Christ. And if you haven't heard that, let me tell you that that is God's truth, that you are loved, that you are worthy. But, let's be honest, sometimes in our prayer life, God tells us an answer that we don't want to hear. Sometimes God lays out truth in a way that is uncomfortable. And you can pray again for a different answer if you want. Sometimes you'll get it. God's truth is beyond ourselves. But in constant prayer, in constant conversation, we learn a little bit more about who God is and what God desires for us. It is a natural response as a creature of the created to be in conversation with God. And how lucky we are that this is God's desire for us, that the one who set the stars in the heavens requires and hopes for and calls us into better conversation with that divine presence. What an amazing perk of being a member of the kingdom of God that we get direct access to the one in charge. We don't have to call a helpline and wait for a couple hours until someone can answer. We don't have to be on hold. We don't have to set up an appointment. At any time, you can call on God, and God will answer if you don't forget to stop listening. What we sometimes do is to call on God and ask for things and then hang up. And then we get worried when God doesn't answer the way we want. Prayer, like any conversation, is listening. Otherwise, it's a monologue. This right here, this is not a conversation. Although I always hope that people interject during a sermon lovingly and, and share some loving banter. I, I really thrive on that. Uh, it, it's, not a, it's not a dialogue. It's not a conversation. It's, it's just an opportunity to preach. But any conversation requires the back and forth 
any communication requires multiple voices. So when we pray to God, we can't forget to listen. If all we're doing is talking, then we can't hear the answer. We should pray unceasingly and in all situations. Whether it's over a loaf of bread or, or over a hot dog. I, I had to use that picture from Jib Jab. I, I just, I couldn't pass it up. If you ever go to Jib Jab and Gerard, that picture's hanging in the restaurant. And it's a famous old painting, but uh, Jib Jab made sure to, doesn't have the chili cheese, but. What can be said that hasn't been said? Perhaps we just need to listen. But in all things, pray unceasingly. In all things, be in conversation with God, who is always your friend and has been since you, before you even initiated the conversation. Because that conversation was going on well before we were born. While we were still at the source, we were having conversation and communing with the divine. That is something that will not end even past this life. Of that I am almost certain. For it is the nature of who we are as human beings to be in conversation with one another. But as the created, to be in conversation with the divine. So pray and listen. Immerse yourself in prayer. Amen. Dialogue functions in so many ways. It can inform, it can challenge, it can set apart or bring together. Our conversations with one another form who we are, shapes our identity, lets us know truth, and lets us know falsehood. We are better people because we have been able to communicate with one another. We are better people because the divine has chosen to communicate with us. This is an example. This table is an example of the power of Christ's words. Because of one historical event, millions of people across time and across space has gathered around this table to see what Jesus has to say next. This is one point of an ongoing conversation that will continue, we say, every week until Christ comes again. Amen. And how good it will be when that time comes. But until then, we are called to gather and to share stories and to converse with one another and to have conversations where we can share love and challenge lovingly and grow together. This table functions as part of that conversation. And though the words might be similar every time we gather, the response every time we gather is unique. So I invite you to hear the words that have been passed down to me and will be continued to pass down. But I invite you as well to hear the response that happens after this table. So I pass on to you that on the night that Jesus was last, uh, last ate with friends and with family, with those that would deny, deny him and betray him, he took a loaf of bread, and after having blessed it, he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat it, eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup, and after having blessed it, said, this is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, drink in remembrance of me. For as often as we have the opportunity to break bread together, to share a cup, we are having a conversation about what comes next, 
about what God has done, about what God is doing now, and what God will do next. And we will preach that God is doing wonderful things in this creation because we have been told by God that God is doing these things. Because we have seen it. Because we know in conversation with God, we know how to listen and to hear God's voice. We will preach this good news until Christ comes again. So I invite you to take that bread and to partake as Christ's body broken for you. And to take that cup and partake as Christ's blood shed for you. Amen. Join me in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, each week we rejoice in the opportunity to come to this table to share in this bread and this cup because we understand that they symbolize Jesus' broken body and shed blood, but more importantly, his victory over death and through that victory the opportunity for each of us to share in your eternal kingdom. We thank you for the gift of Jesus and we thank you for this table. And our prayer this morning is that we never forget what this bread and this cup symbolize. Because with each passing day, they become more significant in our lives. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness and all the gifts you give us each day. Your generosity overflows to us, and we give joyfully so your love and light may be seen throughout this church, throughout this community, and throughout this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Might we join together in our closing hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See. then our benediction. Go forth today constantly speaking to God immersed in prayer. May the knowledge of the Creator's presence in our lives lead us to fullness and joy. May Emmanuel, God with us, lighten our footsteps, ready our hands for service, lift our souls to praise. 
doing all things for the glory of our God. Amen. Thank you.